Lord be with you. We welcome Paul to our worship this morning. As we gather here, we're continuing uh, the season of Epiphany happened this past week. That's the season of light. Uh, perfect time for this emphasis on light as all the darkness is around us. Uh, we have the light of Christ. Today we're going to be looking at the mission, God's mission continues, the baptism of our Lord and how that impacts the mission that has come to us and the mission that we are uh, uh, to the world. A couple of announcements. We have pictorial directories are in, so as you leave today, be sure to pick yours up. Uh, did a wonderful job, uh, Janine and Marilyn Snyder. Janine Consolano and Marilyn Snyder, they are to be very commended. They did a lot of work on that whole process, and I think they turned out very well. Uh, they are copies in the back. You sign those out. Also in the back as you leave today, we had some extra fresh oranges and apples, very good, that were left at our, uh, weren't used at our food bank, and by the time we have food bank again, they wouldn't be good for that, so please, we want to make sure that they're all gone as you all leave today, so grab one of those. I've tasted them. They're excellent. Uh, we do have a congregational meeting next week at 2 o'clock. This is discuss the possibility, uh, and it is just a possibility of having a lift or an elevator in church. Um, some of the, uh, the blessings that that could be, but maybe the challenges to compose. So just a general discussion. No vote will be made on it, but next week, uh, Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Installation of officers will take place uh, today, so if you are on a committee or want to serve, uh, the names are for the most part in the bulletin insert, but we might have forgotten a couple, so we realize that, so please come forward. That will be right after uh, the sermon. We'll have the installation of officers and committee members, board members next year. Are there any other announcements? We sing the first hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold my servant whom I uphold. I will tell of the decree. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. You shall break them with a rod of iron. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Serve the Lord with fear. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold my servant whom I uphold. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people. with you. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Our first reading for this uh, celebration of the baptism of our Lord comes to us from Isaiah 43, 1 through uh, 7. Uh, baptism is connected here as we see that he has called us by name, by name, as we were named in baptism and the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was placed upon us. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading uh, is the basis of the message this morning. is from Romans 6, 1 through 11. And it shows how baptism, which happened for us some time back, connects us to Christ's death and resurrection, which happened some time back but it has uh, present-day implications. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. We rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he was mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our common Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated at this time of the children's message. And I see Bowden here. And Bowden, you can stay right there if you want. Okay, he's having a uh, so good a little snack there. That's good. All right. So how are you today? Good. I want you to look at a couple pictures here, okay? Can I show you something here? So I want you to look up here. All right. What is that happening with that family? What are they doing there? Do you know? They're hugging each other. And that's how we show that we love each other, right? That we care for somebody. We need a big hug. Well, do you know that God gives you and I a big hug in a very special way? Okay. We're going to talk show about that in a little bit here. Okay. Oh, this is another way that we show that we care for people. What's that girl get receiving there? A present. Did you, did you get presents for Christmas? Yeah. Wasn't that fun to receive those? Oh, that's good. Mario games are good. Very good. All right. So we're going to look here. What's next? So what happened here is there's a story in the Bible. There's a story of Jesus, and he's in the water, and he's being baptized. Now let's say baptism on the count of three, okay? One, two, three. Baptism. All right? So he's being baptized, and do you see what's above Jesus? Do you see what's up there? Does that look like a bird? It's kind of a dove, okay? That's the Holy Spirit. He says, it's white. It is white, yeah. So uh, with you, I am well pleased. Uh, and that was a wonderful thing, okay? Now, the other thing Jesus did for us, it's really wonderful. Do you see what's, you see the cross there? Do you see the cross way in the background? He died on the cross, and he rose it again for you, Bowden, especially for you. And he wants to show you that. And to do that, he wants to give you a kind of a big hug. But he doesn't give you a hug. Here's what he does. You ready? All right, here we go. That's probably how you look sometime back when you were baptized. Might have been a little bit different, okay? And that's kind of like God giving you a big hug, saying, you are my child, and you're loved, and you're forgiven, and I died for you. I sent Jesus to die for you and rise again. And this next one says, I know you maybe can't read that, but it says, I am a child of God. So, are you a child of God? Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So, I have got, uh, let's have a prayer. And there, we're all going to help you out in praying this, okay? So can you fold your hands? Okay, and repeat after me. Dear God, you love us. You send Jesus to give us a big hug in our baptism. Thank you for that. Amen. All right. Now, when you come by yourself, you get something special. All right? So we did this last week. Pick a book. You can pick a book. You want that one? Very good. And then I'm going to give you this too. Okay? Great. We sing the sermon hymn.
grace, mercy, and peace be unto each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whose light continues to shine in this world and draws people to himself, including you and me through the power of the Spirit. We're in that light season, uh, wise men, epiphany, light and darkness, outsiders becoming insiders. Epiphany season is uh, one where we're going to be having a look of God's mission. The look of God's mission. Last week we heard how God is in mission, and I mentioned it earlier, drawing people to himself like a magnet. He is drawing, bringing people to himself. It is Jesus who came to seek and to save the lost. And that's still happening. His mission is happening no matter how big the church is, no matter what sort of viruses are going around us, his mission continues. In spite of many hindrances, and some of these seem like major hindrances, apathy around us. We live also in a very distracted world. And then you have our own inabilities and sins, but the message that Christ came to forgive sinners continues to move forward. And by the grace of God, we are part of that mission, as well as gloriously not only receivers of the benefits of that, but also we're part of that mission as his people. Today we're going to look at how baptismal blessings from Romans chapter 6 described there play a key role in the look of God's mission. And one of the real key blessings that comes from baptism is an identity, a new identity. The blessings of baptismal identity changes us. Everything about us, not only this connection, but it also changes the way we live. And that's the main point that Paul makes in Romans chapter 6. Baptismal blessings are part of God's mission. We see that from Jesus himself in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see baptism kind of funneled into that along with teaching, and then I'm with you through it all. Baptismal blessings are part of his mission. We've been alluding to it that our identity is very important and the most important thing about our lives, really the most important is our connection to God that's made possible because of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's everything. And this connection with our Lord and our Savior is our ultimate identity. We have a lot of other identities. But first and foremost, the, the text claims that in baptism we are connected closely to Jesus and his death and resurrection. Here's a Bible passage that we read here. We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. The, the sense of Paul is that what happens in baptism is that we bridge time and space. We almost go back 2,000 years. We join Christ on the cross, where he joins himself to us, and in the, in the tomb, and we're so connected to him that the only way you can get at us is to get at Jesus. The only way you can destroy us is to destroy Jesus. And so baptism has that sort of connecting aspect to it. It wasn't merely a past event. Sometimes we think of it as a dedication. You know, we got our pictures and we see it as a past event. But rather there's something ongoing about it. This continual connection of the claim that God has made on us. And it changes how we live. In fact, our text says it allows us to walk, walk as a present thing, in newness of life. He claims that through this we have been crucified with Christ and buried with Christ. We have a new identity. Our ultimate identity is as a baptized believer in Christ. A lot of other identities in our life that make us who we are in our work, our school that we attend, 
you know, if you're in St. Louis, they ask you what school. I don't know if they do that in southern Illinois, you know, what high school did you attend? But that that's defines who you are. A relationship with others. We're married, we get friends with this. Um, our hobbies, even our physical well-being to a certain extent. But these aren't our ultimate definers of us. These aren't our ultimate identity. Our failures, our sins, the troubles that swirl around us. Some may say, well, this defines us. This is what's going on. This is kind of who we are. No, that's not who we are. What Christ has done for you on Calvary, covered your sins, and then delivered the benefits that, of that to you in the washing of water and the word that claim, that Jesus, that death and resurrection for you, that defines you. And this message is not only needed in our world, but I would contend this is also attractive to the world. It's all part of his mission. Because we live in a world that is disconnected. And baptism is all about connecting. Interestingly enough, it talks about us also being baptized not only to Christ, but also to his body in the Bible. So there's this connection, and then there's this connection. And also to a world where these other things that seem to be what we, uh, identities that the world has for itself, they become wanting over time. You know, our work isn't the be-all and end-all. Our health is going to not be as good as we want it to be. And into this world, we can bring something called, that God has given us, called baptism. Let me say a few word things about that word, baptize. You know, for the most part, this isn't part of our everyday language. Um, if you were back in Jesus' time and you were to say, go baptize the dishes or go um, clean your room, go baptize your room, that, that was the language that was used. In fact, in the ancient world, it was not only common to use this, but it had a very striking, almost violent use. If a ship sank, it was baptized in the water. In the water. There you see the Titanic there. The word was also used, baptized, to describe what happened when someone drowned. There's this sort of violent thing. This is kind of a powerful, destroying use of the word. But as I alluded to earlier, the word also had positive connotation. It cleaned things up. Kind of a, a use for cleaning or scrubbing, something that's really hard to... No, you would say, go baptize that. So it had this destroying aspect to it. Both were powerful, but also this cleaning sense to it. And that's just what happens. That, the sin needs to be destroyed. It can't be just covered over. It needs to be destroyed. Here's what he writes. You have been baptized into death, buried with him, crucified with him. Because of that, you are no longer enslaved to sin. Now, we'll see this later. It's going to say, you died to sin. What that means is, sin no longer has the power over you that it once had. Something that dies no longer has power. It says, you died to sin. You've been cleansed. And it was no small thing. It was, dare we even use this term, a violent thing. There was a drowning of sin and death. That's the language of Romans. Why? So that forgiveness and everlasting life would now be the dominant note in our lives. Now what is astounding about this is that baptism itself, it just doesn't have that look to it. It kind of has a, a, a light look to it. I don't know what the term would be, but a kind of a, a, a weak look to it almost. You have a little child, it's nice. It's you got a little bit of water. You have parents that will have a baptism here next week at this service. Looking forward to that. Parents hoping that the children around them will behave well during the service and that the child doesn't scream too much as the child is being baptized. Now, it can look like kind of a small, act, quaint act, a dedicating type act. But the way the Bible describes it, it describes it in the sense of Jesus' death and resurrection. It has a sin-destroying, death-conquering, forgiving everlasting life act to it, or a sense to it. In other words, God is hard at work claiming us as his own in baptism. Now that has a practical connotation to life, and that's what I want to refer to next here in Romans chapter 6. 
But before we get to chapter 6, I want to touch on the end of chapter 5. Paul was addressing here some surprising statements he was uh, dealing with, or he was making some surprising statements concerning what God's expectations are, his law, and grace, which is his undeserved kindness. Here's what he was essentially saying. He said that the clearer the law is, God's expectations, sin increases. So the more of the laws you have, sin increases. Here's what he writes. The law uh, comes to increase the trespass. That is, the law has a tendency to uncover, to diagnose previously unrecognized sin. Now, usually we think that the more laws that God gives, the more he tells us, don't do that, do this, especially good ones, the more improvement you're going to see with humanity. But he says it's just the opposite. The law reveals sin. It uncovers sin. That's the bad news. But the good news can be found in the statement that follows. Where sin increased, so this happens when you see the law in your life, grace increased all the more. Sin is here. Grace isn't like this. Equal. Grace is here. Death is here. Life isn't equal. Life is here. Right? So his sense of it is sin could not keep up. The more sin that is uncovered, there even more grace abounds. Now that's fabulous to hear. Especially for those struggling with guilt or shame in their lives. But it also can be heard in another way. It can sound reckless, dangerous. Let me give you an example. Well, Paul, does that mean if I steal 10 times and forgiven each time, I'd be better off stealing 20 times? And then you'll get more grace. He knew that was the argument that was going to be coming. If you're just going to say you're forgiven for sin, then why not sin a lot? And so that's where we enter chapter 6. Here's what Paul says. Are we to continue to sin that grace abounds? By no means. I would like to translate that another way. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? How can you who have been baptized, who are dead to sin, still live in it? That's not who you are. Don't you know who you are or whose you are? You're acting like you're not baptized. It, like you haven't been claimed by the king of kings and you don't belong to him. It's kind of like this. You've been released from death row. Crime you committed and graciously released. And the moment you get that fresh air, you say, Oh, I don't like this. So you go back to the prison where death row is and you knock. And you say, let me in, let me in. I want to go back in. That's what he says. How crazy is that? That's not who you are. Isn't it interesting here how he handles sin in your life? Not by going to the God told you not to do that type of thing. But rather he goes to this isn't who you are. You're not being who you are. You are your baptized identity. You've been buried with him in Christ. You're united with him in his death. That's a beautiful thing. United with him in his death, connected to him. One person once said that since you have been buried with Christ, by the way, when I first, I ran across this, I was at a church in high school or college, we were singing for, a, I was with the musical group, and they had this banner that said, you've been buried with Christ. And for some reason, I had never come across that or couldn't remember that particular verse. I thought that was the strangest thing. You've been buried with Christ. What a strange thing. But it's a beautiful thing come to find out. One author wrote, you've been buried with Christ and in that tomb it's the only place in the universe that God doesn't look at your sin and death. You can't see it. It's been cast as far as the east is from the west. And here's the other thing. You want to hide in life? You want to get away? <laughs> in your baptism, you get to do just that. You want to start a new life? We as, baptized, we as baptized believers get to do just that. We get to hide with Christ. 
I would contend that's an attractive message of life in our dying world. Let me read this verse again. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been free from sin. Died to sin has no power over us, ultimately, and we're free from it. It's still part of our lives, but it's no longer the dominant note. Now, I mentioned in all of this that, that this is, an, I think, an attractive thing in our world that, that deals in a couple of areas. Um, and, and we get this because we live in the world and we have our own sinful nature. And without Christ, without God, you have two things that are playing in people's lives. And the first is that of pride. Now, pride is, I'm in control. I'm in charge of life. We control our own destiny when it comes to all significant things. And well, maybe there's a sense of the fates guiding things or the universe is at work and things. Ultimately, in the end, in the end, it's about us. The problem with pride, the problem when it's all about us, is that things about us falter. Health falters. The longer we live, at least I find this to be the case, the less able we are to foolishly think we can control the world around us. So pride's at the one end. And, and, and thankfully, God, through his law, can bring that down. But the other side of it is despair. This view would look at the universe. Again, this is without unbelieving world. This is without God, without Christ. And it recognizes our smallness compared to the vastness of the universe and the vastness of the problems of the universe and considering also ourselves. They're so great. And to the despairing, death seems like a relief. But it's all alone, separated from God and others, and that's not good at all. Here's an attractive message to this unbelieving world. The Apostle Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, says, you can die, you can hide, you can get away, but not die alone but die with Christ. Here's what he says, Now if you died with Christ, we believe you shall also live with him. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, alive to God. The sin in you, the sin around you, it has died, which means it has ultimately no power over you, or ultimate power over you. I would contend this is an attractive saving message in a pride-filled and despairing world. Baptized into Christ, baptismal blessings, being connected to the crucified and risen Jesus, not just as a past thing, but as a present thing. It's not that we were baptized, but that we are baptized. That's a better way. That's a true way. That's a hopeful way. That's a forgiving way. That's a living way. And gloriously and wondrously, it's a way that has come our direction. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This time I would invite forward all those who are um, board members this next year, are in some sort of position. We're going to be standing right up here. I'd invite you to come forward at this time. Again, we might have forgotten a few names in the bulletin, and so if we did, please feel free to come forward. We'll come up here and just stand kind of spread out a bit. And you'll face me. One of the, the blessings of doing these dedications is just for us to see how many people uh, it takes that God uses to for the work of his church his congregation and so we're very grateful uh, that he is using you in this way beloved in the Lord the scriptures admonish us all that all things should be done decently and in order to that end the Constitution and bylaws of this congregation establish various offices 
to which men and women are elected and appointed to serve. In so doing, the church follows the example of the early church as described in Acts chapter 6. The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this day. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. The Apostle Peter writes in the first epistle, At each, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. You've been elected and appointed to serve various positions for the 2022 year here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Columbia, Illinois. Uh, you are to... Uh, you are to see that uh, while holiness of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all members of the congregation, it is especially important that you as office bearers and various positions in this, church, in this congregation show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him in service and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the positions entrusted to you? And do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord, and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, then answer, I do. And now to the congregation. Beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by these men and women whom you have selected and have been appointed to serve in this congregation. Do you promise to support them in their work, to remember them in your prayers, and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you? so that he may be glorified and his work be done in our midst? If so, then answer, we do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I install you as officers, board members, and appointed members, the various positions here in the congregation, St. Paul's Lutheran Church for 2022, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty and most merciful God, enlighten and strengthen you in your positions, that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his name and the good of his people. Amen. And let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly implore you to grant them by your spirit those gifts needed for the faithful carrying out of their tasks, especially wisdom, strength, and willing hearts. Let your blessing rest on this congregation. Strengthen the faith, quicken the love, and enkindle the zeal of its members that your name may be glorified, and that here and in all places under heaven, the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people and have now completed their time of service. We pray that in the end of days, we, with all your faithful people, may hear the voice of Christ saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So go in the name of the Lord, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. You may return. Congregation is invited to rise as we sing the offertory and as the offerings are brought forward. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice.
our prayers this morning. We have prayers requested on behalf of Joe Sterick. He is recovering from foot surgery, so we pray for him. Also a Thanksgiving prayer for David and Julie Greeting, who tomorrow are celebrating their 35th wedding anniversary. Let us pray. O Lord, you are in mission. Desire all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We thank you for your baptismal blessings by which you give us our identity. Connect us to Christ's death and resurrection. Hide us in Christ and allow us to live dead to sin and alive to God in you. Help us to treasure this great gift and continue to spread the news of having a Savior uh, who brings such blessings. Lord, in your mercy. For 35 years of married life given to David and Julie, greeting, we give you thanks and praise. Help them to continue to grow in faith towards you and love for each other through every shared sorrow and joy. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you have placed us in this congregation, in this community, to love you and serve others. Guide and direct all board and committee members, those appointed to various offices, that they might faithfully serve in the various ministries of this congregation, so that Christ may be proclaimed, his word taught, and his love be reflected in all we say and do. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, we pray for the mission work of Unity Lutheran School in East St. Louis. Grant your continued blessing upon that school that as the students learn the skills necessary to function well on this your good earth, they might also know from where all good comes and in whom there is forgiveness, life, and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are sick, recovering from COVID, living with cancer, recovering from surgery, on this day, we bring before your merciful th throne the following who are in need of your healing, hope, and strength. For Nancy Jan, Jerry, Joe, Marcello, Gloria, Alberta, Jeff, Dennis, and Linda, Adele, Becky, Sean, Tracy, Debbie, Anna, Paul, Elaine, Chris, Sandra, Wayne, Terry, and Kathleen, along with those we now bring silently before you. Lord, in your mercy, as this new year begins, help us all to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give us a willingness to repent, to receive your forgiveness, to joyfully come to the Lord's table and read your word. Help us to be faithful in prayer and ever ready to serve those you place in our path. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For at his baptism, your voice from heaven revealed him as your beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit descended on him, confirming him to be the Christ. And therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created, and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, 
We receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all availing sacrifice, his body and blood on the cross. And gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom you have died to sin and are alive to God, may this strengthen you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and in his joy. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let everyone who seeks the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy with shouts of Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that once again you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn. Oh, 